so now we'll kind of jump into our keynote. Um, I, it's my tremendous pleasure to introduce Dr. Bharat Ramsundar. So Dr. Ramsundar is a, an extremely accomplished you know, individual. He got his PhD from Stanford um, and he is a, you know, a renowned expert in, um, in both machine learning as well as drug discovery. He has written two books, TensorFlow for Deep Learning from Linear Regression to Reinforcement Learning, as well as Deep Learning for the Life Sciences. He's also the lead architect, uh, sorry, the lead um, developer for a piece of software called DeepChem, which I believe is now the, the kind of the preeminent software for drug discovery in open source, if I'm not mistaken. And so he's done some really amazing work as well as founded two companies. So I'd like to introduce him and he's going to be speaking about AI uh, in drug discovery and medicine in general. Welcome Bharat. Oh, uh, thank you for the very uh, kind introduction, uh, Nisha. Um, are you able, is everyone able to hear me all right? Uh, yes, we can hear you, yes. Okay, wonderful. Um, let me just go ahead and share my slides. Uh, one sec. Okay, um, is everyone able to see uh, kind of the slide deck? Okay, all right. Uh, so let me just kind of go ahead and uh, dive into it. Um, you know, before we, uh, we start with an actual you know, technical presentation, first I want to say it's, uh, I've had the pleasure of kind of knowing the entire AI club team for you know, a very long time now. So actually, uh, uh, Nisha is my first boss right out of um, my first job in undergrad, um, you know, quite a while back now. So I uh, learned from her back then you know, why research was really exciting, why it's something that you know, was you know, just on a pleasure. And uh, I, I think from there, kind of, you know, uh, help me spur me to actually go to grad school to actually uh, start my career as a scientist. So thank you for kind of inviting me uh, back here to speak, Nisha. I think it's uh, an absolute pleasure. Uh, so I think with that, you know, maybe just a couple short words about myself. I think Nisha already kind of uh, covered this in the introduction. I think, um, so I remember listening to uh, talks to say like a high school student myself, and you'd always wonder why am I listening to this person? Now, I, I can't claim I have an excellent answer for you today, but uh, here's a few of the things that I've worked on over the last several years. Um, a lot of the work I've been doing has been applying, you know, uh, deep learning or, you know, AI, depending on how you'd call it, for uh, pro towards problems in drug uh, discovery. So drug discovery very broadly is the science of, you know, finding new medicine. This is something, of course, that's, you know, critically relevant. We've seen this in the coronavirus pandemic. We've seen this, of course, in uh, throughout like a host of different applications that the, the ability to discover new medicine rapidly, I think, is going to be one of the uh, potentially dramatic shifts in science over the coming decades. It's an extraordinarily hard challenge. And in fact, you know, one uh, figure that, you know, people always like to talk about in this field is something called Irun's law. So some of you might have heard about Moore's law, which is, you know, depending on how you state it, something like uh, transistors get twice as dense uh, or twice as cheap, and things improve uh, very rapidly on the computational end as you get more compute cheaper and more effectively over time. So one of the kind of paradoxes has been that for a long period of time, from the 1950s until the 2010s, the process of finding new medicine has really behaved oppositely to this, as in you get less medicine for more cost over time. Uh, now, there's a whole variety of reasons why this could happen. Uh, one is there's a, a, you know, a dearth of low-hanging fruit. That is, you know, a lot of the obvious discoveries were made already, and people increasingly are struggling to find uh, new technologies for harder and harder problems. And there's some truth to this. Um, if you look at, say, diseases like cancer, cancer is extraordinarily complex as a disease because it's actually a whole range of different diseases that have different treatments. It's also kind of reactive in that, uh, unfortunately, if you have something like a cancer and you try one drug, oftentimes the tumor will route around it. It's kind of an adaptive learning uh, organism in some sense. So it's, uh, if you are wrestling with these really hard diseases, things do become harder. But I think there's also a bit of a story in terms of, uh, you know, regulation and safety. You know, as we've learned more about uh, ways in which potential medicine can be harmful, you also have tightening regulations around what can and cannot be allowed to actually make its way to human patients. Uh, there's, you know, definite uh, arguments about, you know, is more regulation right or wrong? And I think there are some good reasoned uh, 
you know, discussion on both sides about, you know, we should loosen regulation or we should tighten it for new medicine. Um, but I think that, you know, a third potential uh, answer here is that, you know, a lot of the way that, you know, drug discovery had been done in these years was very kind of manual and human driven. In some sense, if you look at the process of discovering new medicine, there's this long multi-year pipeline. Uh, so kind of the uh, six bullet points here that I'm putting uh, represent probably a decade's worth of work for an entire army of scientists. Uh, it's an extraordinarily complex process. You need to kind of uh, first come up with a hypothesis for say that if I have a particular disease, uh, what is the driver behind the disease? Uh, in, in reality, you know, if uh, you've ever uh, worked with an actual patient, you know that an actual disease is an extraordinarily complex uh, thing. It's not the fact that you can just say that there's only one thing that is say driving you know, a person's Alzheimer's or a person's Parkinson's. But for the purposes of drug discovery, for the purposes of science, we often need to be mechanistic and reductionist. We try to pick a simplifying hypothesis. We say that I believe that this disease is caused by this one protein in this person's body uh, going, you know, out of control or, you know, not functioning correctly. And the reason you do this is this gives you a starting point. You start from one Thing that you could potentially fix and then you try to fix that and if that works great if that doesn't work you go back and kind of repeat the hypothesis tying this back into say the scientific process that all of you have seen so let's say now that you've you know picked your disease you've now picked a potential biological hypothesis for what causes this disease then the next thing is you want to find some uh you know compound in some sense that interacts with this potential target um, this is, I'm using a bit of jargon here, but the idea here is that uh, you can think of a um, kind of a lock and key analogy is commonly used in this field. Maybe there's kind of a lock biologically somewhere in your body, and you need to somehow just design just the right key that will unlock the lock and make, uh, you know, say this protein function correctly or make this uh, uh, clean up, say, this uh, sub process uh, in your cells. Um, uh, in your cells. This is a, uh, you know, very crude uh, explanation of a very, very complex uh, system of dynamics. I, I think that, uh, you know, but again, it kind of comes back to these themes of, you know, when you're dealing with something as complex as, you know, finding new medicine, you just you often end up making these repeated uh, reductionist uh, constructions, which help you uh, get a handle on the complexity of the process. And then from there, you know, once you have this, you know, first key, oftentimes what you need to do is to change it so that it's actually safe to consume as a actual medicine for humans. You know, the crude example for this is if you just want to kill, say, tumor cells, if you pour bleach on them, they'll die. But that doesn't mean that's a medicine. You can't give bleach to human beings. So often the process that takes something that, you know, destroys or modifies something in the body to something that's safe for consumption can itself be this very long and complicated process. And in many ways, it, the I, you know therapeutic discovery is sort of an engineering process. I bet we have a bunch of you know, parents or engineers in the audience, um, and a lot of this probably sounds familiar. In that you know you're trying to design this object, and you're trying to tweak it so that it has these desired set of properties. Now the challenge is that. You know, in human engineered systems, we know a lot about the context in which we're designing something. In you know medicine discovery, we don't really understand you know the human body at all. Um, and you know the reason is that evolution is this monstrously complex thing that I think human minds often struggle to understand. Like four billion years of complexity are often packed into any living organism today. And in order for us to be able to kind of deal with this complexity, we just need better tools. And that's kind of where you know, a lot of the work that uh, you know, I've been doing, um, other people have been doing comes about, which where you say that can software help us with these techniques? So uh, I, I jumped ahead a little bit there, uh, but I thought it might be useful to give just a brief uh, uh, a look ahead at, you know, some of the topics we'll be discussing in the rest of uh, today's presentation. You know, let me just kind of come back and actually start talking about the rest of how medicine is discovered today. Um, so if you've ever worked it with uh, you know, people in the biotech or pharmaceutical industry or have the chance to work with them in the future, you know, one word that you might hear a lot is something called proprietary. Um, if you have a new company, you say, we have a new proprietary technology, secret technology, that's very powerful. Or we uh, have you know, a proprietary way of doing X, a proprietary way of doing Y. Sometimes this can be very powerful. Like sometimes companies really do invent new and powerful technologies that 
you know, can change the world in a small way. Uh, other ways it's marketing. You know, if you uh, are coming up with a new startup and you say, we've invented a secret sauce technology that no one else in the world has, that can be very uh, appealing to investors. Uh, unfortunately, these claims of proprietary knowledge often have these unexpected side effects. Um, the first is that it leads to a lot of patent disputes. Um, you know, some of you might have, say, followed the legal disputes over uh, the new genomic technology of CRISPR. So CRISPR is this very powerful new gene editing technology that uh, was invented, depending on who you ask, at either Berkeley or at MIT. And Berkeley and MIT's lawyers have been having a very, very expensive drawn out court battle to settle this. And what's at stake is a whole pile of money, because people want to be able to use CRISPR. Uh, to actually cure diseases, but they need to know, do I pay my royalties to Berkeley, do I pay them to MIT, or do I pay them to both? Um, and of course, there's you know probably billions of dollars at stake, so there's a whole lot of legal paperwork that gets uh, filed there. So you know this is fairly standard, I think, for biological techniques. Um, patents are kind of a way of life in drug discovery. Um, however, this also tends to bleed over to the software that surrounds drug discovery. Um, if you've, you know, ever, if you've, uh, you know, if you've ever used kind of software, and I, maybe I might be talking to the parents rather than the kids uh, from the '90s, and you have, say, like you know, expensive licenses, and you have, you know, uh, you need to pay for Windows, and it, it uh, you know, each person that say uses your software additionally, you have to pay like another uh, a seat license. This is kind of still the world in which uh, the software of the biotech drug discovery ecosystem operates. So think very, very expensive as in say like 100,000 for a basic license for a small company and maybe 10,000 uh, per additional person who wants access to the software. Um, you know, part of these expenses are justified. Making scientific software is an extraordinarily hard endeavor. You need to pay the bills somehow. Uh, but on the other hand, it does often mean that these like techniques for uh, computationally designing new medicine are just not accessible to students or hobbyists. Um, you have to be often a very well-funded company in order to be able to make use of these tools or be lucky enough to be at a very top tier academic institution that can afford to pay for these licenses. So, you know, this is a bit unfortunate because we're also seeing this you know, dramatic shift in uh, how medicine is discovered today. I'll say, uh, I'll call this trend, you know, software driven drug discovery. Um, you know, as we've all seen, software is just increasingly powerful for many uh, many tasks we do today. Um, so, you know, if you say we're doing an integral like 20 years ago in calculus class, you might say have to, you know, look at a table, you might have to try to uh, work it out yourself manually or, you know, ask your teacher. Nowadays, you know, you go to Wolfram Alpha and say that, you know, here's an integral, you know, nine times out of 10, Wolfram Alpha will have, uh, will have your pack. Uh, if you look at, say, you know, other fields of um, engineering, other fields of uh, design, increasingly software you know, tends to carry a lot more of the weight in terms of making it easier for people to do their jobs in these fields. It shouldn't be surprising really that the same has been happening in drug discovery. You know, increasingly people are using computational tools to design new potential medicine. Uh, you have the new technique, uh, which is called molecular machine learning that I'll, you know, touch back on and that, you know, is a subfield of AI that's used to design new molecules that really is starting to find broad uh, adoption uh, in this industry. Uh, but it's still you know, very early in that a lot of the ways in which medicine is discovered uh, is quite low tech. Uh, so if you actually look at some very, very successful you know, drug discovery scientists, many of them will just you know, stare at you know, slides on uh, a screen or at most in Excel. Uh, and they're not going to be using a fancy technique. They trust their gut, their intuition, their built wisdom over time more than a software-based technique. Uh, and this is, you know, I think uh, an interesting transition point where, you know, there's a power to the old way of doing things in which, you know, a uh, grizzled scientist actually just uses their deep understanding and intuition uh, to really jump at a hypothesis. But there's also power to the new way of doing things where you, you know, co-adapt and coexist with software or AI, where it helps you as a partner, you know, pick out molecules that uh, can do things that you couldn't otherwise. So I, I think there's a very interesting transition point in this entire scientific field. And you know, zooming out probably in society as a whole, where you know, we are beginning to increasingly outsource uh, parts of our thinking to external software systems. Uh, for example, yesterday I was uh, 
on the road and I was driving somewhere I'd never been before. And, you know, I just turned on Google Maps and, you know, followed the directions. Uh, this, this is, in, in some ways, this is kind of what it, it's like to have like a software co-pilot when you're doing these types of design. Maybe you depend on the software to help carry you through portions of, you know, the design space that you couldn't uh, go otherwise. But the, you know, the potential weakness is that, say, I couldn't have gotten to this place if I was driving by myself. Same, the same way, uh, I, and I might not know how to get back there myself if somehow Google were taken offline. Uh, so if you're a scientist, you might worry about, you know, am I designing a molecule that's a potential medicine that I don't understand? And if so, what are the unforeseen consequences? So, you know, uh, coming back again from the tangent, uh, the, uh, the other trend I want to briefly mention to you all is that, uh, you know, if you use modern software, there's another you know, large trend towards what I'd say open source, you know, very much the opposite of proprietary. Uh, the, uh, I think Anisha touched on this briefly in her introduction, but, you know, the power of open source is that anyone uh, can start to use the same tools that world-class you know, scientists and researchers use. So uh, if you're using TensorFlow, you know, broadly, you're getting very close to the same access to tools that Google's internal engineers might have. Uh, or if you're using React, you might, you're using the same technology to create displays that Facebook's engineers are. So this, I think, has really radically started to alter the way that, you know, the tech industry works. Um, increasingly, these types of, you know, consortium software, things like Linux, uh, are not really designed by any one company, but are these, like, de facto standards that are used broadly across the software ecosystem. And this just dramatically changed how modern software is built. And I think, I, I would argue, has enabled a lot of the new types of you know, cool uh, software tools that we have today, because you can build and match and swap and, you know, reconfigure these systems as you need for new applications, which just unlocks a whole bunch of human creativity. Um, so, you know, the, the, you know, tying these two strands together, uh, you know, the goal behind the DeepCamp project really is to take some of this dynamism from the software world, this world of open source, where you have these interchangeable parts and ideas, and bring it to the world of drug discovery, where you know, there are these very deep, hard scientific problems, but also maybe a more old school way of looking at, you know, software and systems based on secrets and proprietary standards, rather than, you know, open, uh, open software that is kind of accessible to everyone. Uh, our core thesis is that open source can help medicine discovery. So we do a number of things uh, in this vein. We you know, create new open software. Uh, we you know, establish new open source data sets. We have a lot of educational material, um, books, uh, tutorials. Uh, later in the talk, I'll mention some research uh, that we've been doing recently that might be interesting and a bit more about how we run our research community. Uh, you know, where we got started. So. Uh, you know, several, a few years ago, it's actually now like uh, uh, during my PhD, I was working uh, at Google Research and I was lucky enough to have access to some of their uh, uh, compute capabilities as an intern uh, in one of their teams. So we, you know, had a great time working together. We made a, you know, cool new paper, ran it on Google's computer and, uh, you know, got some neat results. But, you know, when I came back, you know, to grad school after finishing up my internship, I quickly discovered that, oh, wait, I actually can't access the system I built anymore. Of course, it's like Google. What do I do now? I still need to finish my PhD and graduate. So part of what I started doing was just trying to recreate this, uh, you know, some of the ideas but from scratch. Uh, and just, I put them out uh, as open source because I thought, you know, why not? Like, uh, I had a couple of friends down the hallway that were asking me about, oh, you know, what's this thing you're building? Can you show us? And we're, I was like, yeah, sure. Let me just, you know, make it public uh, and put it up uh, somewhere where you can see it. And the project's kind of grown from there. You know, it's uh, increasingly just created by a large consortium of different community members who have their own interests, their own kind of passions, uh, who use it in a very broad constellation of projects. Um, we, you know, have a whole range of different applications you can use DeepCam and its tools for now. Uh, you can use it to say design molecules. Increasingly, you can use it to design things like materials, work with batteries, work with um, proteins. Uh, and really, I, I think our goal is to you know, bring the, this new found technology of AI more broadly to the sciences. So this means you know, a lot of base software engineering, a lot of kind of community growth and development uh, that we do in order to get these ideas out there. So I'll come back and, you know, say a bit more about our community shortly. 
Uh, but, you know, first, I want to just say a few words about some of the scientific underpinnings here uh, behind technology like eChem and maybe a little bit more broadly about, uh, you know, the rapidly expanding field of, you know, AI uh, in the sciences. So I mentioned this a little bit earlier in the talk, but one of the core technologies you use is something called molecular machine learning. Um, you know, to zoom back, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll take a little bit of a digression here and just say that uh, what we often call AI today, uh, we mean uh, something more technically referred to as machine learning. And what we mean by machine learning is, uh, is often this very technical mathematical concept that is also easily conflated with, you know, the more, you know, sci-fi notion of a thinking machine. And the notion, the line is fuzzy there. Some of the most complex machine learning systems can have a behavior so, you know, strange and evocative and uh, radical that it's not at all unnatural to say to believe that they're um, thinking in some way that's roughly analogous to what we do. Uh, and this is, I think, you know, a source of, you know, considerable controversy, I think, within this, within our field and uh, throughout science more broadly. So I'm not going to try to solve that today. Let me just try to explain a bit more about what machine learning is. Um, you know, very broadly, machine learning is when you present a series of uh, patterns to, uh, oh, sorry, when you present a series of, uh, hmm, I think I, oh, whoops. Is there a way for me to, oh, there. When you present a series of patterns to a, uh, a computer system and you ask it to try to learn a rule that maps input patterns to output patterns. This is an extraordinarily broad idea and it's one that you know is applied in technology you've used all the time. So if you use Google Translate, you you know the input patterns are say a sentence in one language and the output patterns are a sentence in another language. If you use Siri, the input pattern is say your voice speaking to Siri and the output pattern is whatever action Siri is taking. Uh, based on what your voice uh, provides. So for molecular machine learning, the input patterns are molecules and the output patterns are properties of these molecules. For example, uh, if I have a proposed molecule, I can potentially have my output query be something like, would this be an effective treatment to Parkinson's? Uh, that's of course an extraordinarily complex query. It's probably too hard for our systems today to answer. So we have to prune down the set of things we actually ask about molecules to where this makes sense. Um, there's a few challenges, I think, in this field. Uh, the first broadly is that in some portions of AI uh, development, there's a lot of, you know, these patterns to, uh, you know, provide raw grist for the machines. If you look at Google Translate, it's probably trained on literally trillions of sentences that people have written on the internet. So you take sentences from one language uh, in, a, in a parallel a set of sentences from another language. Oftentimes people use things like, you know, the UN charter to bootstrap these systems or other uh, sources of reference text. I think the Bible might be another common one where you have the same text in many, many languages. And you use that to kind of bootstrap the system and you kind of glom on lots and lots of data because people tend to write lots. Whereas for uh, drug discovery, it's, it's very hard to come by data. Uh, the people who have the most data are of course, you know, the biggest pharmaceutical companies. Uh, who've been in many cases doing drug discovery for up to a century. The challenge is, of course, they've spent, you know, entire piles of money, uh, and this is kind of their beating lifeblood of their corporations to gather these experimental results. So it's hard, you know, for them to justify being able to open out this data for public research. It is not in their personal interest. Uh, academic scientists and governmental organizations do release uh, open data, but even for them, it costs a lot of money to do these experiments. Uh, it's not easy to perform them. You need to often have specialized scientific training to do the types of experiments these systems uh, need for the training data. Uh, so this means that this is kind of one of the, the hardest questions we deal with is that how do you learn from only a few patterns of data? And this is where, you know, the line between, you know, machine learning as a sort of statistical mathematical technique and machine learning as a almost process of AI or intelligence starts to blur. Uh, you know, I, I'd argue intelligence you know, one definition among many is the ability to, you know, take, you know, a very limited set of stimuluses and come up with a, uh, a new direction. So if you're a scientist or, you know, uh, what's, you know, the made up story of Newton seeing the apple fall, 
from the tree and going from there and extrapolating to create gravity. So that's where I think we blur the line between these older school, uh, you know, statistical ideas of, you know, machine learning as almost what you do in stats class, just something that is this notion of intelligence. Uh, you know, talking about just a couple of other things that we deal with, uh, you know, molecules come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. Uh, so for some of the kids out there, you might have taken, you know, AP chemistry class or AP bio class, uh, you know, you probably recognize that uh, some molecules can be very simple objects, something that you could also most imagine making a test of yourself would say uh, not too much difficulty. They can also be these very complex, uh, you know, biological constructions. Uh, the, uh, you know, blob, at, the colorful blob at the bottom is a representation of a protein. Uh, I, I believe that's what's called a kinase. It's a very critical uh, protein that ends up being uh, coming up a lot when designing uh, cancer therapeutics. Uh, and this can be hundreds or thousands of atoms uh, in many cases. So, you know, how can one learning system be smart enough to deal with this extraordinary range uh, of different uh, uh, inputs? Then that's, I think, part of the challenge that we face. The other, you know, brief thing I'll mention there is that uh, Oftentimes, we are not really interested in answering questions about molecules that we've already seen before. Uh, if we already had a compound that, you know, could cure a disease, we probably would have come across it already. Uh, there, there are some caveats to that statement that I'll be a little careful about there. But uh, in general, we want to find new molecules that do the things we'd like them to do. But the challenge is that, you know, it's like, you know, asking a test problem on material that was never covered before. Uh, maybe you can figure it out from, you know, smarts, but uh, maybe you can't. And these molecular machine learning systems struggle the same way in that if you really ask it a question about a type of molecule it's never seen before, it's going to be very difficult for these systems to really make meaningful predictions. And part of the art of molecular machine learning is understanding, you know, what is the limit of what this thing is learning? How can we expand the scope of its understanding um, but do so in a way that respects the limited amount of data we actually have in practice. Uh, you know, diving one step deeper just for a minute, uh, one of the core mathematical techniques we use is something called a graph convolution. Uh, this may or may not be familiar to some of you. I'll you know, try to just give a very brief explanation. So at the you know, top left of the screen, we have a uh, simple molecule. And the idea is that a molecule can be represented as a mathematical object that's called a graph. Uh, you can think of it as a graph as a type of diagram. Uh, so the atoms are these represented these like dots we call nodes, and the chemical bonds are represented with these lines we call edges. And for each atom, we write down a simple set of you know, descriptions about what this atom is. It could be that this atom is a oxygen. Uh, it has you know, one neighbor. Uh, and it has a double bond connecting it to that neighbor. Maybe these are the three pieces of, of information I write down. And for every atom, you have a similar set of information that you write down. These are represented as these little, you know, black and white and gray, um, you know, well, vectors is the term we'd use for them, uh, just like lists of uh, numbers there on, on this, uh, the, in the graphic up top. And the process of graph convolution is where we take the information spread across this, this graph and we combine and recombine it, trying to find patterns that uh, emerge uh, from this type of data. Uh, there's a lot of technical details behind how this actually works. I, I think the way I like to think about it is that um, it's, it's sort of like you're doing a, uh, a mixer. You have, you might say, know that you know, this oxygen over here on this corner of the molecule has these properties. Maybe this chlorine over here on the other has these properties. But when I combine them together and meet at the center, I might actually find that there's an interesting emergent property that uh, is formed from some behavior of the oxygen and some behavior of the chlorine. Uh, now, I I'll be the first to confess that's probably terribly fuzzy. Uh, in practice, the way we work with these things is we just kind of use them in software. A lot of these deep learning tools are, are still very mysterious. We don't entirely understand how they work, but they do work in practice. So if you're ever working with one of these systems and you're just like, what on earth is this even trying to do? I just recommend trying to find some code on the internet that 
uh, can help you just run these things and seeing what happens. Uh, and honestly, that's how most people got started using DeepChem. We put out one of the first maintained implementations of graph convolution uh, on open software. And that is kind of how people started playing with our tools is they, were, uh, they found that was useful to help them understand. So, in, uh, uh, sorry, let me just do a quick check. I, I think, how am I doing on time? Uh, I might have gone a bit over so far. Um, so it's 10.09, so um, you have probably another, I would say about 15, maybe you know, 17 minutes. Yep. Uh, folks who have questions, please feel free to put them on the Q&A and Bharat can answer them after you know, he's done with his presentation. So. Okay, wonderful. Uh, thank you, Nisha. Uh, so let me just kind of walk through some of the other things we do. So uh, what we do as part of the DeepCam project, we also gather lots of open data out there. As I mentioned, data is scarce. Thankfully, a number of academic and research groups have put out open data sets. So we try to serve a bit as a clearinghouse where we try to gather as much publicly available data into one place as we can to make it easier for new researchers uh, entering the field. Uh, we also provide a, you know, just a series of utilities for processing molecules. Uh, this is a bit of a technical term that uh, comes up along machine learning. It's something called featureization. The idea is that uh, oftentimes when you have an you know, AI machine learning system, it can only process inputs in a very limited set of formats. So you need to somehow take the actual inputs you have and transform them into a form that can be used by these systems in practice. And this transformation is called featureization. Uh, it turns out that uh, for molecules, there's many, many ways you can do this featureization. I, I think in DeepChem, we probably have 30 something at least. Um, you know, there's probably many more that are out there proposed in the scientific literature. Uh, and you know, this is just representative of the complexity that actual molecules are these very complex uh, constructions. And there's many, many different ways to look at them. And we represent that complexity by providing these different tools that let you represent the molecule in a slightly different way to the AI system. And by using all these different representations, sometimes you can get a broader understanding of what the molecule does. Um, you know, I, just to you know, provide a, a brief look at some uh, of our you know, results. So one of the classical ways you try to study something like molecules is to use techniques like simulation. Uh, a simulation broadly, you write down the known laws of physics, and then you step-by-step uh, step let a system evolve according to these known laws of physics. Uh, you know, for those of you who've taken, you know, uh, AP physics, maybe this is, if you write down Newton's laws and then you say have a cannonball that shot out of a cannon, you can potentially graph out where the cannon will uh, fall. And you can even do things like, you know, account for friction. You can account for the curvature of the earth. You can make these very complex simulations that, in fact, is probably what NASA does really uh, for doing things like orbital calculations that take the laws of physics and apply them out at scale. So this, these techniques are very, very broadly used. It's the foundation of modern science. But machine learning, I think, in many ways, uh, take shortcuts. They say that, you know, it's really hard to write down and evolve Newton's laws. What if I just try to guess the answer? Um, and you know, this sometimes works, actually. Uh, so one of the experiments we did a few years ago was that we asked, you know, how many uh, data points do I need input before my guesses actually start to become accurate? Uh, to the degree of a known simulation. So the dotted line here, in this case, is one uh, particular simulation for one particular scientific task. And the different uh, colored lines are different, uh, you know, what we call architectures, different representations of molecular machine learning systems. And one thing we found was for some of them, without too many examples, you actually start to become more accurate with your guesses than the classic physical simulator. So this is, I think, in, in one sense, this encapsulates why machine learning is so fascinating to scientists today, in that it provides these shortcuts. It provides these ways to, uh, with a few data points and a few examples, to extrapolate uh, and interpolate in places that you know, classical simulation engines struggle to do. Uh, it, it, this is also, as you can see here, there's some machine learning architectures worked, some didn't. Uh, a big part of the actual complexity of working with these systems is that we don't really understand why things work or don't work entirely. So there's a lot of guesswork. There's a lot of practical, just try it and see uh, trial and error that ends up happening. Uh, so, you know, we're running a little bit short on time. So I'll 
uh, you know, just quickly mention a couple of these other slides. We have some tools to, uh, you know, study uh, what are called binding pockets, which are this very critical, uh, you know, scientific notion that explains how a potential drug-like molecule actually interacts with uh, a protein that can be in your body. Uh, you have to really do a lot of physics to get this right. You have to think about, you know, what are the electrical interactions? What are these, what's the statics, what are the dynamics? Uh, so there's a whole bunch of science that goes on in that field. Uh, it's, I think, a very powerful uh, discipline. Uh, basic idea is, yeah, geometry can be used uh, as an input to some of these like uh, deep, new deep learning systems. And there's some really exciting new companies that try to leverage these capabilities to design new molecules. Uh, and I think, you know, I thought, you know, to wrap up the, uh, the talk, it might be fun just for me to mention a couple of you know, ongoing uh, research projects that we have within DeepChem. So, you know, DeepChem is a fairly broad consortium of people. There's a whole range of, uh, from, you know, actually multiple high school students up to, you know, actual full professors and practicing scientists uh, at various organizations that use DeepChem uh, for different tools and projects. So one of the nice things is that this just creates these like very nice, uh, you know, mashups where people tend to like meet and ask, talk about questions that, they wouldn't have met and talked about otherwise. It's kind of the magic of the internet in uh, some sense. So one recent, now here's a couple of recent papers that we had at the, uh, uh, you know, the NeurIPS, which is one of the prominent uh, uh, AI conferences workshop for molecules. Uh, this was the last, sometime in 2020, I'm forgetting. Uh, one, you know, paper we had briefly uh, dealt with the problem of molecular generation. So let me just try to see if I can capture something. No, so I'll, I'll try to just give a brief explanation here. Oftentimes we want to come up with new ideas for molecules where we want the, uh, the machine learning system to give us a new candidate molecule and ideally a candidate molecule that's never been seen before. It turns out for technical reasons, this is very hard. Uh, you know, molecules are very complex entities. To design a new molecule from scratch and have it be chemically valid can be very challenging. Uh, there's a, you know, uh, so there's a host of different techniques that uh, people have invented for designing new molecules. Uh, but oftentimes, uh, what happens is that the vast majority of molecules that your system proposes are invalid. Uh, so one, I, I don't mention this here in this uh, table, but uh, one project I worked on my PhD, we think generated like 5% valid molecules from one of these systems. So 95% of the, the, the molecules that we proposed were actually just chemically invalid. So there's been some, you know, complex new methods people have designed to enforce chemical validity. In this particular paper, what we uh, came up with was we realized that just by a very simple idea, which is, you know, changing the output format of the molecules so that uh, we leverage some new work uh, in writing, how to write down the structure of a molecule from uh, the Asprey Guzik lab at the University of Toronto, we could make a simple technique that would have base validity of five, ten percent, have like nearly eighty percent validity. So I, I think this is like a very clever uh, uh, construction in that we didn't do that much work, but it was just a nice observation. And this was really led by uh, kind of like co-author and uh, lead author in this work, uh, Nathan. Uh, who came up with this observation that you could just combine this new file form and bam, this old technique starts to work much better. Uh, it turns out you can use this new uh, simple primitive to help you design molecules more effectively. I won't you know, say too many details here, but if you're interested, glad to point folks at the actual paper and answer questions about it. Uh, I'll also you know, mention briefly like one other uh, project that we've been working on. Um, so this is a paper called Converta. Uh, so in fact, the, the lead author of this work was a very talented high school student named Seon, who, uh, you know, got involved with Deep Chem uh, probably, you know, over a year ago at this point, and has just been really working hard with us on expanding out this range of techniques. We also have, you know, I, we only have three authors in our first preprint, but our team has grown since. Uh, we have, you know, multiple engineers, uh, uh, from, you know, a, a cool startup called Reprie Labs working with us, uh, and of course me. Uh, and the idea here is that we use this new technology called the Transformer. Uh, some of you might have seen this, I think, from AI Club courses or uh, your other, uh, you know, personal learning. It's this new technology for dealing with uh, sentences as input. 
Uh, and what we really investigate in this work is, can we use this new technology to understand molecules more effectively? So we definitely did not invent this idea. There's been a number of other academic groups that really have been uh, exploring, you know, how these new sentence technologies uh, can help, you know, enable deeper understanding of chemistry. But we've been doing a lot of work trying to understand, you know, can this actually beat the best of the models that are out there in these graph convolutions? And the answer, at least in this early version of the paper is no, but uh, they can't, as in the graph convolutions at the time just did a lot better than these new sentence-based methods. But one thing we observed that you know, gave us a lot of um, excitement was that, you know, again, I'll just run roughshod over some technical terms without really trying to explain them fully in that, as we used more and more input molecules, these systems got better and better. And we could do this in a way that meant we could bypass the need for complex experimental data and just take in a raw chemical structure. So the idea is in principle, we could just you know give this like a giant database of molecules, have it work out the you know, grammatical structure of the molecules, and then use that to actually make predictions that one day could be more accurate than the best alternative molecular machine learning system out there. And so there's a lot of like technical depth in that I'm like glossing over here, but we think this is a really exciting idea that could help bypass the need for, um, well, partially bypass the need for more experimental data when designing a new medicine. So this is something we've kept working on. Uh, I know a lot of different groups, uh, notably, I think probably the best groups right now are at, are at MIT, uh, University of Toronto, uh, you know, uh, uh, Montreal, uh, there's uh, definitely a few really beating institutions uh, that are push continuing to push the boundaries here. So we're excited to be able to play a small part uh, in helping answer some of these deeper questions. So the, some of this uh, kind of code is already up on DeepCam. So this is just our quick look at our uh, documentation for uh, one of the outputs from this project. Uh, and, you know, I'll, I think I'll just wrap up uh, this talk, hopefully, by you know, saying a few words on how, you know, you can potentially start to get involved with open source medicine discovery yourself. Uh, I'll, I'll mention there are at least a few talented high school students who have done this. Uh, it's also just very hard, being totally honest, to do research as a high school student. Um, I, I, my first research project in high school, I wanted to do quantum computing, but I could not find a professor who was willing to talk to me back then. So I um, read a bunch of papers and I coded something uh, in my room in Java by myself. I, I, it, gave, it got me a science fair like uh, award, but I, I question whether the results were meaningful. So part of what we try to do with DeepChem is that, uh, like at least for a lot of us, like we very much understand, you know, that feeling of, you know, wanting to do real science, but not being taken seriously. So we will take people seriously, but that also means it's also very hard to do this work. So um, people who, the kids who I think get the most out of this actually stick with it. And there's a whole range of deep scientific concepts. So it can be very hard to do this, but I'll, I will just hopefully, you know, if I've spurred a few of you to be interested, point you at a few resources. So if you go to uh, you know, our, our website, we have a whole range of different tutorials or something like 20 or 30 tutorials. Uh, these are unfortunately written at a level that is targeted, I think, at someone who already understands some machine learning. But, you know, hopefully, for those of you who work through some of the AI club courses, this might actually be a place where you can start to understand. Uh, we've, you know, I see there's just a list, I think, as of last counting, we probably have 25, 30 tutorials that do various things. Uh, we have a pretty active community. So if you kind of hop in the chat room, uh, I will likely answer within a day or so. Uh, there's also, you know, several students working on and deep chem right now this summer. Thankfully, uh, Google has been so kind as to uh, fund uh, four students for us this summer from uh, Google Summer of Code. So there's a lot of you know newcomers starting to kind of uh, learn more about how to work with uh, deep chem and you know really learn how to use these AI techniques on new problems. Uh, we also have these forums. Um, I think this is a snapshot of the forums from a while back. But if you go on there, you'll see people discussing a number of new threads and issues there. So. Uh, you can raise scientific questions, you know, participate in some discussions. It's it's a pretty open scientific community. Uh, you know, there's a book we wrote a few years back uh, that tries to explain some of these ideas. It's it's a vast field, so 
I, I, I will say that, you know, with a few years more writing experience now, there are some things I wish I could go back and change. But I, I think for now, it still remains one of the better uh, references out there for just getting up to speed on these new class of techniques. Um, I'll, I'll also just mention a couple things. So uh, there's a lot of room for new improvement. Um, for one, you know, all these vaccines that, you know, hopefully all of us have taken um, by now, uh, they were not really designed with too much computational uh, tools. They were mostly designed the old school way, which goes to show you old school techniques were extraordinarily powerful and actually can do like amazing, amazing things. But it would be really cool if you could actually do, you know, AI guided vaccine design, maybe for, you know, God forbid the next COVID or the next uh, pandemic threat out there. So there's a lot of these tools where I, I think there's not great software right now that does them. Uh, for some of them, there's good proprietary software that's very expensive. Others, just no one's worked this out. So I think there's an entire world of open uh, problems here. And I think a lot of opportunity. Um, you know, broader area, one that we don't get too much in is that, you know, doing an experiment can be extraordinarily complex. Uh, you know, resources like YouTube, resources like other web resources have started to make it more understandable how to do complex experiments, but it's still something that just requires a lot of know-how. So making you know open blueprints and protocols, I think, would be a really cool future direction. Um, and you know, I'll, I'll just kind of uh, uh, end by just saying a few words about uh, you know what it takes to kind of build what we're calling a decentralized research organization. Uh, so, what is a decentralized research organization? So broadly put. Um, you know, although we were born as a project at Stanford as part of my PhD, uh, it's now this, you know, thing that lives on the internet. Uh, there are many things that live on the internet these days, Bitcoin, Ethereum, uh, among others. So this is kind of an actual home for these new uh, projects. And there's, there's a lot of power to just living natively on the internet. You get these unlikely collaborations. People meet and talk who wouldn't have met otherwise. Uh, but it, it is also just this, uh, has its strengths and weaknesses like any other construction. Um, one thing that I think is a strength of ours is we take a lot of effort to do documentation. So uh, all the meetings for DeepCam are open, discussions are open, so you can uh, literally any of you here can like dial into like our developer calls uh, or read our minutes. They're all on the forums. Uh, this means it's a lot easier for people to get a sense that they understand what's going on at the project. Um, I, I'll say, you know, on the good side, we have a lot of, uh, I think, global diversity. There's a lot of contributors from different countries, different parts of the world that participate. Uh, you know, places we need improvement. We don't do a great job yet at really capturing underrepresented populations. Uh, it's mostly, um, right now, young men from backgrounds well represented in STEM. So we're working on improving our outreach, but this is, you know, extraordinarily challenging and uh, something that, you know, we have a lot of room to learn and get much better at. Um, you know, challenges that we personally think that we struggle with, uh, you know, onboarding newcomers is hard. Uh, the basic material is hard. The uh, you know, staying motivated can be very hard without uh, an environment where you have kind of peers going through the learning with you. I think part of the reason that colleges and schools work is that if you find people complaining about a teacher or problem set, it just bonds you and you actually like struggle through it. If you're on the internet and you're stuck in a room by yourself, it can just feel very isolating at times. Uh, so that's something we struggle with. We try to have as many open calls. We have office hours to help uh, combat some of these issues, but it's uh, not something we've solved. Um, the other thing is just pipelines. Like um, in many cases, and I suspect even for many of the students here, kids who get involved in science were those whose parents were already involved in science. There's a self-propagating um, yeah, dynamic to it. Now, this isn't right or wrong, it's the way the world is, but it would be nice if there were a way for anyone to get involved, where there's more accessibility to people who don't have those backgrounds. But it's just extremely hard. There's so many little things you pick up from like, you know, how to read a, uh, read a book, read a paper that sometimes uh, kids without those opportunities don't really uh, get. And, you know, we don't have an answer to this, this is such a giant problem. We wish we had a better pipeline. We continue to iterate with new ways. Uh, that we can do better. We're running a little short on time, so I just wanted to let you know. And there's a question, there's a bunch of questions that are, oh. you know, are, are waiting for you. So, you know. Yep. Uh, sorry, I have I think two slides. Let me just uh, okay, go through sure. these no really problem. quickly. So there's there's a few ways we're looking at how we can improve this. Um, if you're uh, there's also I think I'll mention very briefly some deep deep structural inequities and uh, 
you know, structural racism, really, in the way medicine has discovered. This is a notion of a subject, and I'm not an expert at this, but I'll just point you at a few resources. Uh, check out things like the Tuskegee syphilis study, you know, Henrietta Lacks, uh, Darker, Joseph Mengele. There's a lot of, you know, darkness in medicine discovery that hopefully the world can do better at now. Um, and finally, just to wrap up, uh, you know, oh, I hope that you've caught a little bit of a taste for the types of problems we work on. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, Deep Chem uh, is everything is open, so you're very welcome to join on on a call uh, later this weekend involved with research. Uh, and uh, I hope to see some of you kind of join in and hopefully do some really cool work and get something out of the project. So with that, I will uh, stop. Uh, uh, so my apologies if I was a bit rambly. I uh, don't usually speak to high school students, uh, so this has been a bit of an experiment for me. So uh, thank you for being the guinea pigs today, and hopefully it wasn't too much of a bore on a Sunday morning. So with that, thank you. Thank you very much, Bart. I think it was really good. And uh, just for anyone who is, you know, interested in those resources, this video is recorded and will be shared. So don't worry if you couldn't jot down all the resources, they will be in the video. So no worries about that. Uh, so there's a number of questions. I think maybe we can just start with some of the questions that came on the chat. So one was, uh, and other than discovering new drugs, can these techniques improve existing drugs by removing side effects? That is an excellent question. And, um, the answer is, unfortunately, it's very hard to do that. And part of this goes into this, the structure of how medicine is approved and that. So if you want to take a new medicine, you basically have to do a whole bunch of experiments and take it to a government body uh, in the US, the FDA, that signs off on this medicine being given to actual patients. This is an expensive, time-consuming process. And during this process, they document the many side effects that uh, have happened. So it's hard to go back and, you know, fix a drug that's already out there because it's in that the, the unit was approved was the medicine that exists. What you can do with tools like Deep Chem and, you know, other scientific uh, engines out there is say, can I make a new type of drug that has a similar effect but without the side effects, but you're in effect making a new medicine. Got it. Makes sense. And then I think there was another question, which was about um, sort of uh, what kind of models, you know, work best in this. So inside the deep chem, after you get past the featureization and everything, what kind of AI are we talking about? Yep. So I'd say graph convolutions for the most part. Uh, transformers are probably the second most exciting uh, area. There's there's many, many different models people use. I think there's some like 30 different models in deep chem, but those are the two big families that tend to get used a lot. So, and by the way, for those who are more you know, interested in transformers, our second student who's going to be presenting, Abhinav, is actually using transformers. He's not using them for drug discovery. He's using them to analyze Twitter feeds. So that should tell you a little bit about the range of these technologies. And then I think there's some questions about deep chem themselves. Um, and I just, I think I'll just, I think the questions are generally about what is, what programming language was used, you know, how much compute does it take to run one of these? So maybe if you can just say, uh, you know, a couple of things about yep. deep chem itself and what the nature of an experiment from a size of the bread box. Yep, yep, yep. So a deep chem itself is written mostly in Python. Um, there's a lot of very gnarly system software that we deal with because, uh, uh, it's like at this current last uh, time of speaking, 70,000 lines of code at least. Um, Python is not really meant to make systems of this scale. So uh, there, there's some adventures we have if you're curious about the, the, the science and nitty gritty of software engineering that we do to glue all this together. Um, servers that we need, uh, it really depends on the scale of problem. You can do meaningful work on your laptop. There are other people also running or trying to run deep chem on very large clusters and servers at this point. Uh, it uh, honestly, more compute does make it easier to discover things in AI today, uh, you know, much as I wish it weren't so. Uh, so we try to support a broad range of users and we're trying to work on ways that people without access to uh, giant clusters can still do meaningful work. Um, and I think there are a couple of, were there more some more technical questions? I feel like I missed some of I think there's one technical question, but I think we're a little short on time. So what I'll do is I'll send that over to you our email mm -hmm. and copy the attendee so yep. that you can you know, answer the question hopefully directly. So thank you very much, Bart. Uh, you know, this was a really awesome talk. I really appreciate it.